Good morning, and welcome to our talk on uh, address scopes in Neutron. My name is Carl Baldwin from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, I've been working on OpenStack for about three years, and all pretty much all in Neutron, a little bit in Nova too. Um, mo most recently, uh, just getting into uh, some Nova things. But I've been a Neutron core since uh, for about two, two of those years. And in fact, it was right after uh, the Atlanta summit that I, uh, that I was made a core reviewer. And currently, I am I'm still participating very actively in Neutron uh, as part of the Neutron drivers team. And I'm also what they call the L3 lieutenant in Neutron. Uh, so I, I oversee anything uh, L3 and routing related in Neutron. Uh, that, that's a little bit about my background. I'll let my colleague introduce himself. Thanks, Carl. Hello, everyone. My name is Hong Hui Xiao. I am a software engineer from IBM in China. Mostly, I worked in Neutron project. Okay. Um, Hong Hui has, has been a great help in getting this implemented and uh, helping us to, to make the Mitaka release with this new functionality. So Neutron address scopes. Um, I get a lot of questions like, what are these for? Uh, what purpose does this serve? Why are you adding these? And uh, I've had to explain a lot. So when I explain what these are for, I usually go back to when Neutron started. Um, it was envisioned as kind of a well. We're going to have we're going to have tenant networking, and we're going to have a, an external network, and uh, we're going to model this after kind of the kind of how you do your home internet. Uh, your home internet, you have a router probably. Uh, your router probably has at most one public address on the outside, and on the inside you use whatever addressing you want, right? Uh, probably something from from RFC 1918 uh, on the inside. And most likely, there's a lot of overlap um, between you and your neighbors and everyone else in, in the world. Uh, this, this was kind of how Neutron was originally modeled. Uh, we'll, we'll let tenants do tenant networking. We'll let them use whatever addresses they want. And we'll make that OK on the external network because we're going to stick NAT in between the tenant networks and the external network, and it'll all be OK. So there's a couple of problems with that. Uh, number one, we don't do any NAT in IPv6, and we, we don't really want to. Um, we have enough addresses, and we have even if you're not using public addresses, even if you're using private addresses, we have a way to, to, to almost guarantee that you're not going to overlap with anyone else. And the other problem is that some people, uh, some organizations don't want to put that layer of NAT between their tenant networks and their external networks. Um, since, you know, a long time ago, we, we had to start creating lots of little routing domains with IPv4 because uh, we've been running out of addresses for a long time, right? So there are millions, maybe even billions of routing domains out there if you consider all the little ones here and there. Uh, and some of them aren't, aren't so starved for addresses that we need to stick an at in between the tenant networks and the external network. Uh, so we, we've had customers ask us, Hey, can we can we just route into our internal networks, our our tenant networks, instead of doing this NAT thing? And well, that when you when you consider doing that, and you consider the model that Neutron uses, where tenants bring their own addresses and and put in whatever they want to a subnet create, uh, it's kind of a problem. Uh, so we need. We need a way, we need a model to isolate the routing domains a little more precisely and to prevent uh, address overlap within a routing domain. 
So actually, this, we, we started adding this feature uh, well over a year ago. In fact, uh, subnet pools, which is part of this feature, has been in Neutron since the Kilo release. And it hasn't changed much since the Kilo release. It's, uh, it was added. It just kind of worked. People actually use it. And it, it's really cool. If you haven't played with subnet pools, uh, you ought to go play with them. And, and in a few slides, I'll have a short little demo showing how, uh, showing how you can start playing with these. But just as an overview of what subnet pools are, it, it's an object that just holds a range of addresses that, that you want to use to allocate subnets. And it, within that range, it keeps track of what's been used and what's available so that when you go do your subnet create, you know, you type neutron subnet create at the command line, uh, instead of giving a, a CIDR that you have to come up with on your, you know, I, I always imagine somebody with a pad, pad and paper scratching down what addresses they've used and which ones are available. Instead of consulting that pad of paper, you, you say um, neutron subnet create dash dash subnet pool, my subnet pool name, and then uh, optionally a, a prefix size. Uh, so you say just, just give me a slash 26 out of this subnet pool. And I don't care what the addresses are, just give them to me. And within it, it, it does all the bookkeeping. It makes sure it, that those addresses that you get are unique within that subnet pool and no one else is using them. Uh, subnet pools are already used in, in a couple of different use cases in Neutron. Um, in Mitaka, another new feature is uh, what we call the auto-allocated topology extension, or get me a network. You might have heard uh, the term get me a network. We've even shortened it to G-man, but that's just kind of a silly name for it. But the, the subnet pools are used within get me a network to uniquely allocate addresses to each new network that's, that's automatically allocated by Neutron. Uh, it's also, I've learned it's uh, Project Courier uses subnet pools, and I've even seen mention of address scopes in, uh, in a blog from Pro Project Courier. And hopefully some of your projects are using them already. Uh, mostly it's, it's a handy feature that, that takes a little bit of burden off of you and puts it onto Neutron. So subnet pools support address scopes. And you might be thinking, well, what's the difference? Um, a subnet pool is kind of like an address scope. It's a, a subnet pool is a thing within which you don't want address overlap, and you want addresses to be coordinated and, and all that. And that, that's kind of what address scopes are. Um, so how are they different? Um, and this is the way I see it. Uh, the subnet pool is a mechanism for, for managing the allocation of, of addresses. And address scopes, they map to, to routing domains. And when, when I was first designing it, I thought, well, maybe we could just have a subnet pool map to a routing domain. Maybe that'd be okay. Uh, but I, I had a couple of reasons that I, I thought it was beneficial to insert another class of object in between the subnet pool and the routing domain. And the first one is that um, subnet pools kind of existed before we had routing domains. And actually, or, or before we had address scopes, the concept in, in Neutron. And actually, uh, there's, there's a thing that I'll go into in the next slide called the no scope scope. Uh, that, at least that's what I call it. And within the no scope scope, there's lots of subnets and subnet pools that all kind of overlap, but they're, they're in the same routing domain. And so it didn't make sense to start tying them to uh, directly to routing domains. And so I decided to keep the, the accounting mechanism, the subnet pool, and the concept of an address scope separate. And also just to make it 
I, I wanted subnet pools to be useful e even if you didn't want, uh, even if you didn't have a use case for address scopes. So then there was, um, in thinking of how to add both subnet pools and address scopes, there was a question of how to maintain compatibility, how, how to keep Neutron working the way it works for people who are using it and happy with it, and also introduce this new feature that, that you may have a use case for. Um, and there, there are kind of, there are some conflicting requirements. Um, first, Neutron allows overlapping subnets, one, and two, it allows you to use anything you want, really, any addresses you wanted. And when we map to routing domains, we want, we want to first get rid of the overlap, we want to prevent it, and we can't just let you use any address you want because we, we have to use addresses that are available and viable within, within a given routing domain. So given those conflicting requirements, um, we couldn't add subnet pools and address scopes and, and make them mand mandatory right off the bat. Um, so if I were to go back and redesign it all from scratch and I had everything was greenfield, I might have, I might be tempted to make them required. Um, make subnet pools composed of subnets uh, where subnets don't really exist without a subnet pool and address scope, address scopes composed of subnet pools where subnet pools don't exist without an address scope. But we couldn't do that. Um, so instead we used more of an aggregation relationship where the subnets can exist without anything, uh, just like they do today. But then if, if you want to get the benefits of using a subnet pool, you can create one and use it to aggregate some subnets. And the same thing with address scopes. If you want, if you have a use case for address scopes, um, then you can create one and use that address scope to aggregate some subnet pools. But it's, it's not a requirement. So this, this lets us have what I call the no scope scope, which is everything without an address scope, and then also have address scopes. And they all work together. So here's my little demo. Uh, it, it's a short one. And it, it shows that these work just as well for IPv6 as for IPv4. Uh, so the first thing to do is to create an address scope. Uh, so it's super simple. Uh, neutron address scope create, we'll create it with the, with the Python Neutron client. If you're an admin, you have an option of, of creating a shared address scope, which just means that it's visible to all the projects within your deployment. You give it a name and then you give it uh, the IP version. And that's it, you get, you get an address scope with an ID. Given that address scope, you can now create one or more subnet pools. Um, so this shows the Neutron subnet pool create. Again, if you're admin, you have the option to create a shared one. Um, you can actually associate non-shared subnet pools with shared address scopes. Um, and that, that's one of the ben benefits of decoupling the subnet pool from the address scope is uh, you can actually, with multiple subnet pools owned by different projects, you can you can divvy up your address space uh, differently for different projects. And once you have a subnet pool, uh, you can do a neutron <clears throat> subnet pool create or subnet create. Uh, given that you have a network, I didn't show that step, but. So here I've created subnets, um, and I don't specify the CIDR. I just specify dash dash subnet pool. And in fact, I don't even specify what size of subnet I want. 
Uh, in that case, I just get the default for that particular pool, um, which for IPv6 is practically always slash 64. And with IPv4, it can vary. In this case, I think I made it a slash 26. And once you've done that, um, if I do a, a net show on my demo network, I can see that there are a couple of new attributes on the network, uh, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6. Um, given that they're, they're completely orthogonal, uh, the two address spaces, um, I can see, now that I've created subnets from an address scope on my network, I can see that, that, um, that my network has that address scope as, as an attribute. So now I wanted to get into um, how we implemented this. And uh, uh, Hong Hui, my colleague, was, was involved with a lot of that. So I, I wanted to pass the microphone over to him and have him explain how, what changes with address scopes in, in L3 routing in Neutron and what that means. Okay, thanks, Carl. <laughs> Let's see the implementation details of address scopes in the L3 agent. Under the hood, it is uh, IP tables which is working. In the router namespace, each router port will be associated with an address scope by looking at its related subnet. As Carl has mentioned, Subnet has information of subnet pool, and the subnet pool has information of address scope. So we can get the address scope by looking at subnet. And uh, every network traffic will be marked according to the address scope of its originating interface at the IP table's pre-routing chain. When a network packet tries to leave an interface and go in a wrong scope, it will be blocked at the IP table's forward chain. In the case of network address translation, connection mark will be used so that the returning packet can be marked with the right address scope and go through the forward chain. We will revisit these items in the following pages with some specific scenarios. First, let's look at uh, east to west traffic. <coughs> we call traffic between private networks as a uh, east to west traffic. And uh, in the east to west traffic, if the private networks are with the same address scope, the traffic between them will be allowed. This is uh, just a normal neutron router behavior. And uh, that's what you have already known about neutron router before address scope. But for the private networks with different address scopes, the east to west traffic will be blocked at neutron router. This is a different behavior with uh, address scope, and that's what we called going around scope in last page. Let's see the IP table rules for this scenario. First, in the mango table of IP tables, every network packet will be associated with a mark according to the originating interface. And if the network packet wants to go into an interface and the mark does not match, the packet will be dropped. The mark here has a one-one relationship with address scope. So if network packet comes from address scope A, it will have mark A. And when it tries to go into address scope B, it will be blocked because the mark does not match. So the traffic cross scope is not allowed. Let's look at uh, north to south traffic. 
We call traffic between private network and external network as a north to south traffic. And in the north to south traffic, if the private network and external network are not in the same address scope, neutron router will do network address translation to the traffic. That's what you have already known about neutron router before address scope. But if the private network and the external network are in the same address scope, neutron router will do straight routing. That's to say, the addresses in the private network can go directly to the external network, and vice versa. Because they are in the same address scope, the addresses of them must be unique and legitimate. So, stretch routing is feasible between them. Let's see the repeatable rules for this scenario. Also, in the Mango table, every connection that will go out of router gateway will record the mark to connection mark. Connection mark can be persisted along with the connection. So, when the returning packet comes from router gateway, its mark can be set according to the connection mark. And as a result, the returning packet can go back to the source address through the IP tables. Also, in the net table of IP tables, the slate will not be used if it is a connection in scope. As you can see in the screenshot, we have an accept row before the SNAT row to prevent the SNAT if the connection is just in scope. As a result, the direct route will be performed. OK, let's see the last scenario, floating IP with a just scope. This is a picture that combines the two previous scenarios. That is, across scopes, east to west traffic is not allowed, and uh, north to south traffic will do network address translation. For the floating IP, it will still serve as an access point for a fixed IP in the external network. That's to say there will always be network address translation between fixed IP and the floating IP, no matter if they are in the same address scope or not. When a port is associated with a floating IP, the port will be given the access to the scope of floating IP. So after associating a floating IP, the VM can access the private networks in the scope of external network, even if it is a cross-scope traffic. This is because the port now have two addresses in two scopes, so it can assess these two scopes. Okay, let's see the IP table rules for this scenario. First, all network packets whose destination are floating IP will be marked according to the fixed IP so that these packets can go through the IP tables and reach the fixed IP. And uh, if the network packet comes from fixed IP and uh, will go to a scope of external network, its mark will be changed to make it go through the filter table. So after associating a floating IP, the port can assess the whole address scope of external network. OK, and that's all about the detail of implementation. Carl, you will introduce the relationship of address scope and other features. Great. All right, thank you. That was good. Um, two things occurred to me, actually, that I don't have in my slides, um, but that I thought m might not be totally obvious. The first one is I want to make sure that we understand that if you don't do anything and you upgrade to Mitaka, nothing changes. Um, 
all your routing, all your NAT, everything. If you use tenant networking, L3 agent routers, if you when you upgrade, nothing changes. Um, the, this these are all opt-in things where you've got to want to use it and configure it to get it. The other thing it, that occurred to me was uh, there's a bit of history behind this implementation. Um, we actually considered at least three different, completely different ways uh, of implementing this. And if you consider all the different possibilities within those three completely different ways, we, we considered probably a dozen different ways to implement this. Um, the one I was going after first was actually to use multiple routing tables and policy-based routing in, in Linux within the router namespace. And I, I actually tried really hard to get that to work um, for Liberty. And I, I just ran into a lot of problems with doing that. Um, mostly, mostly that things just aren't, multiple routing tables are, are, are kind of immature, I guess, in, in Linux. Um, a lot of utilities that you run, you, you might run within the, within the namespace uh, can't be directed toward any of the one, one of the routing tables. Uh, you can't choose your routing table. Um, and, and there was, there were some really kind of thorny issues around getting SNAT to work the way that it works in Neutron. Um, when, when NAT is applied in the router for north-south traffic, getting that to work ended up re being really thorny. And um, we ended up doing this IP tables-based impl implementation, mostly because it was possible. Um, but it does, and, and what's not obvious in, in here is it, there are some limitations to what you can do. Uh, you might expect, well, now I have multiple address scopes. I can connect my routers to, to all these different routed, routing domains and not worry about IP address overlap. And, you know, these, these, are like, these are like verfs. Well, they're not quite. They're not quite that good. And, and actually, um, there, is a, there is kind of a new verf implementation for Linux that we also considered using as the basis for this implementation. Uh, but that was just way too young to even, to even really consider very seriously. Uh, so if, if you think you've got a router now that, can, that can, can connect to different address scopes without regard to address overlap, you might be a little disappointed. Uh, the router will still refuse to connect to overlapping address spaces. Uh, just like it does today, because the IP tables implementation can't distinguish between um, different address scopes in in quite that way. But given the limitations uh, that you in in how you can connect your routers, it does behave the way that you expect. Um, blocking routing and applying that where where you would you would expect it to be applied. So you might still be thinking, I've been talking up here for half an hour, or we've been talking up here for half an hour. You might still be thinking, well, what am I going to use this for? Um, the use case that, we've, that we have in, in Mitaka, and uh, I think Ryan Tidwell is here somewhere. He's led most of the implementation of, of BGP within Neutron. Uh, and he gave a talk here about it. But I'm going to go into it for just a couple of minutes, because it's it's really the, the one relevant use case that we have in, in Mitaka for address scopes. Um, in Mitaka, we've, we've made Neutron capable of being a BGP speaker. Um, we, we did that by adding a new BGP dynamic routing agent to Neutron. And we have, we have all the code and queries and things that, that generate the, the routes and next hops that we need to talk to the external world. Any routers that, that, are, that are just exter external to Neutron. 
So the way we did that initially is um, we associate BGP with a, a network in Neutron, um, an external network. And when BGP is associated with an external network, we take that external network and we gather up all the routers that have their external gateways connected to the external network. And for all of those routers, we look through them and, and we say, okay, what private networks do you have behind you? And for all those private net tenant networks that are behind them, we look at their address scopes. If the address scope matches the one for the external network, then we grab that and we say, hey, that's an interesting network. We can, we can advertise that with BGP. If the address scope doesn't match, uh, or if it's in the no scope scope, uh, we ignore it. So the BGP feature that we've added in Mitaka depends on address scopes. I should have had the picture up the whole time. Sorry, I forgot that was next. Um, so th this is, this is a, an illustration of an external network. Uh, the big router on top, that's the external router. That's a physical router. The little routers at the bottom, those are neutron routers. So those are virtual routers. And uh, you can see on the external network, we have, we have an address space. Um, in this case, it doesn't have to be public. So I, I stuck an RFC 1918 subnet on the external network. And uh, the, the upstream router has the 0 0.1 address, and, and the neutron routers each have their own addresses out of that subnet. And then behind the neutron routers, each one of them has tenant networks. Uh, and I've colored them the same as Hong Hui colored them. Uh, red for, for the external address scope and yellow for an internal one. In this case, uh, projects have created their routers and they've create, most of them have created subnets that belong to the address scope that, that can be advertised outward. Oh, you know what? That's an old slide. I had I actually had a table of all of the <laughs> I forgot to replace the slide. Up in the corner I had made a table of of all the routes and next hops that BGP would advertise. Oh well. So in this case, um, the BGP speaker would be off, off to the right of the slide, and the BGP speaker would create a peering session with the external router, the, uh, the physical router. And when, after it does that, and it scoops up all of the, the tenant networks that belong to the same address scope, it will advertise three routes in this case. Um, each of the subnets with, with the router's IP address, external IP address on as the next hop for that route. And so with that, the, the, te the tenant networks become routable externally and it completes the whole routing loop. Uh, this slide is the same thing but with uh, IPv6 addressing. And the other thing um, I plan to use um, address scopes in is uh, routed networks. Routed networks is, is something we don't have yet. It's not in Mitaka. We're planning it for Newton. Um, a routed network or a routed provider network is a provider network that's not, it's not the typical large L2 that you need for a provider network today. It's, uh, you can route it in any way you want. Uh, you can have any kind of routing infrastructure down to um, the typical use case is a, a router at the top of rack. So each of your racks can have a router at the top and they all belong to the same neutron provider network. Um, address scopes are, are an integral part of this and on such a network, um, you've got L2 segments 
And you've also got the ability to have floating IPs that, that float around the L2 segments. And those are implemented, well, are, will be implemented uh, using a routing protocol and the reference implementation will use BGP as the routing protocol uh, to be able to route those IPs anywhere within, within the routed provider network. And actually, my, I have to run up to another talk where we're going to go into depth about routed networks up on level four um, in Ballroom D just after this. So that, that's all I have. Uh, I'll open up to questions for a few minutes. And if you have a question, please come to the microphone uh, so that we can get the question on the recording. I was just uh, wondering if um, the router is created automatically when you are defining an address cop between two subnets. No, the the router will be created still by the project, um, and the the project will still do the the wiring. They'll they'll set the external gateway to the external network. They'll set their internal ports to the internal uh, project network. And it's, it's when that happens, that's when the magic happens. That's when Neutron looks and says, okay, do they match? Uh, if, they, if they do match, in if the address scopes match, then the uh, NAT is automatically turned off. And, and if you have BGP configured, then the, the routes are announced. Aloha. Um, my use case was where you had multiple pools out of a single scope. You said that was a legitimate use case. Uh -huh. And you said that the site admin could create a global scope. So yeah. a tenant could then allocate a pool out of that global scope, right? Right. The, the tenant would allocate the pool and then request that that be added to the global scope. So my question, the only quotas I'm aware of in Neutron are number of networks, number of subnets, not their size. Is there anything that keeps one tenant from gobbling up all right. the address space? Yeah, sub, subnet pools do have a quota system. Um, quotas are set. Uh, it, it works slightly differently for IPv4 and IPv6. For IPv4, you set the quota in in absolute number of addresses. Uh, in, with IPv6, you set the quota in number of slash 64s that can be allocated. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Carl. I yeah. had a closely related question, actually, um, about the case where you use using both an address scope and uh, sub subnet pools. So is the, the non-overlappingness of IP addresses enforced at the address scope level? Yes. OK. But uh, so there's, I think there's a possibly interesting corollary of that then, which is that if you have a shared address scope, but tenant private subnet pools, it, it may, there may be some allocations that the tenant can't do, but they can't see why not. Is right. That, that, that's that I, very that, insightful. That, that's, that, probably, that's actually perfectly true. That's probably just how it has to be. <laughs> um, there, there is uh, overlap is managed across the address scope, which does create some interesting scenarios when when you have tenants owning the pools and, and, and a shared address scope. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a very good point, Neil. All right, thank you very much for coming. Um, I probably won't have a lot of time to stick around, so, because I gotta run upstairs. But thank you very much, it was a pleasure.